If you've seen the last few tier lists that we've made for Apex Legends weapons, then you know the drill already. If not, welcome! In this long as heck video, we're going to run through the guns in class order and illustrate how they stack up with their competition. The most important thing for you to know, above all else, is how our rating system works. It's a bit more strict than some others that you might see, and it's very important that you actually pay attention and understand what these ratings mean, so I'm not going to give you a skip link to skip past it. Personally, I very much dislike it when other people have S, S+, S++ tiers, and so on and so forth in their tier lists. It makes everything below that completely and utterly meaningless. In my system, if you see something listed as an S tier weapon, it means that it's an item that's clearly overpowered and should be nerfed to be brought in line with the general power level of the game. A and B tiers are where many guns are going to sit, and are typically ideal to take into end game situations. If something is C tier, that's not crap tier, it's average, it's fine. If you land on one of these guns at the start of a match, you shouldn't be upset with it at all but you'll likely want to switch off of it towards endgame if it's easy for you to do so. In D tier, we'll find guns that are pretty clearly underpowered, but on purpose. Don't expect changes to these weapons. Only guns that are down in F tier are the things that would be the opposite of S tier, meaning they're guns that are clearly underpowered and really have no business being there. Be careful to remember these definitions. You're likely going to see at least one gun in F tier that you'll for sure say, but that gun's so much better than the guns in D tier, are you crazy? The answer here is no, and I have to direct you back to the definitions. An F tier weapon is one that's clearly underpowered and not intended to be, where D tier weapons are intended to be at their current power level. These are guns like the P2020 or Mozambique, spoilers here. So those are guns that are at the bottom end and are meant to be there. Guns that are in F tier are not necessarily worse than those guns, but they're way worse than they should be, are very much underpowered, and are prime targets for buffs to be brought into the general power curve of the game, in my opinion. Now, with our tiers clearly defined, let's get into the actual weapon reviews. Let's start off with the R301. This gun has fallen out of vogue recently, and I think that this is one of those guns that people are kind of sleeping on, to be completely honest. The situation with this gun versus the flatline is almost exactly the same as the R99 versus the Prowler debate, which we had about a month ago back on my channel. Your DPS and your TTK values are so close that the difference between them is pretty negligible. Personally, in a perfect world where I spawn in on an R301 and flatline right next to each other, and I could only take one, I'm taking the R301 every single time. In my opinion, the recoil is much easier to manage, the iron sights are much better, and an R301 serves as an excellent attachment holder for the R99. Looking only at the R301 intrinsically now, it's the same as I've been saying since launch. Good at all phases of the game, easy recoil, excellent DPS and TTK, rock solid hipfire with a center dot in the crosshair, which not a lot of guns have, a common ammo type, and great iron sights. This gun has a lot going for it, and I think this gun is pretty much the bar for what's been considered a B-tier weapon. However, I can totally understand arguments for it being an A-tier weapon as well. Let's call this one the gatekeeper between the two tiers. I think that's a pretty fair rating of where it sits. Next up, breaking our order a little bit, I want to jump to the flatline next, since it's pretty much the R301's cousin, and as such, this is kind of a hot topic. This gun is, for all intents and purposes, identical to the R301 and that it's strong in all phases of the game, can equip Anvil Receiver just like the R301, plays at the same range, uses a similarly common ammo type, etc. While in the past I've always rated the hipfire of this weapon as a cut below the R301, lately I'm sort of questioning that. I took both guns into the practice range for a bit, standing in the exact same spot, and tried to recoil control my way through some hipfire kills on some dummies from the exact same range. While this isn't a super scientific test by any means, in a few minutes of repetitions for each gun, I can't say that I noticed a significant difference in either of the guns or felt a difference in either of the guns. The R301 had a tough initial recoil upwards that required significant correction straight down, but after that was easy to keep on target. The flatline, on the other hand, recoiled consistently to the left and right and made it difficult to keep on target. Despite this, they felt close enough to the same that I couldn't pick out a clear winner. 
Suffice it to say that wherever the R301 goes, the flatline inevitably follows. I think the difference between these two guns boils down completely to personal preference, ammo availability, and attachment availability. While the R301 can be an attachment holder for the R99 or a G7, the flatline can be that for both the Prowler and the Wingman, two guns that are often equally or more valuable in endgame situations. The Hemlock has received a buff to its damage a few months ago alongside a significant nerf to its single fire firing rate. In Season 4, the single fire firing rate has been bumped up to roughly halfway between the original fire rate and the nerfed Season 3 fire rate, currently sitting at 384 RPM. On paper, the gun is very strong with its newish 22 damage per bullet, and if you find one early game and can land a headshot or two from your burst on one of your opponents, it's absolutely nasty. The hipfire is still really solid, and remains my favorite hipfire of all the assault rifles in the game right now. As an additional plus, a high tier extended mag isn't really a hard requirement. Level 1 heavy mags on this gun is plenty. In my opinion, the most glaring downside of this weapon has to be its iron sights. They are in contention for some of the worst in the game. They block a significant amount of your vision, and even bad AD strafing can cause you to completely lose your target between the blockiness of the irons and the muzzle flash of your gun. Luckily, the muzzle flash has been significantly toned down with the system override event, so we'll have to see if that's enough to make the irons suddenly usable again. While I don't usually do well with this gun and try to toss it out for a flatline, prowler, or wingman, it's still really strong and very versatile, and it can do some very degenerate things if you've got god-tier aim or a lot of luck. This is another solid contender for B-tier. Next up we have the Havoc, which has received numerous changes over the last couple of months. We're back to the launch magazine capacity of 32, with the removal of turbocharger and a small buff to select fire. This means that overall, the gun has gotten a lot weaker since you never half a way to get around that wind-up period before shooting the gun. While I'm a huge stand for the Havoc, and think you can usually play around this quite well, I understand that there are quite simply a lot of situations where the wind-up will get you killed no matter what. Even though the recoil is easy to control, and your DPS is technically better on this gun than any other assault rifle, the wind-up is a massive penalty in enough situations that I have to drop the gun's rank because of it. On the plus side, because it's now back to the over 30 round magazine by default, finding one of these guns early or mid-game is pretty, pretty good. The irons are great, the TTK is great, recoil is easy, and even if there's no ammo next to it, you've still got a deep mag loaded into it by default. If you get a good beat on a target or manage to get a point-blank fight, the damage output and bullet hose nature of this gun is actually hugely beneficial compared to some of the other assault rifles. Finally, we have the Select Fire Havoc. Again, I am a huge Havoc stan, and think everyone dumps on this gun a little too hard. I like Select Fire Havoc, and with an improved fire rate, being annoying and beaming people for charge rifle-like damage without actually having to run a charge rifle is pretty awesome. Couple this with the fact that one stack of charge rifle ammo is only good for 20 shots, while a stack of ammo for the Havoc is worth way more, and you've got an interesting niche that this gun fills when you compare the two weapons. More shots per stack, more shots per mag, and a higher rate of fire at a cost of... what? A shorter zoom optic? The charge up damage? I think there's something valuable here, but anyways, I digress. Because of the wind-up period being a perpetual problem that you can't always play around in either firing mode, this gun has to be placed a cut below the rest of the assault rifles. While I personally think that it's a fine gun, I have to admit that I always find myself dropping it before Final Circles because players are quite simply a lot better these days than they were a year ago in Season 1 King's Canyon. The wind-up is just too punishing now, so welcome to C-Tier Havoc. Lastly, for our assault rifle category, we have the G7, which is now technically an assault rifle thanks to the most recent Season 4 update. This change was made specifically to remove the G7's ability to equip sniper optics, meaning the longest range scope it can take is now a 2 to 4x. There was a max fire rate drop as well, but that didn't end up being that significant to really impact this gun's tier placing in my opinion. 
Your time to kill sits pretty consistently about a third of a second slower than the rest of the assault rifles, but between its massive headshot damage, easy recoil, and consistent long-range performance, this gun can feel like it's killing faster than any of the other assault rifles available. This gun has been a huge point of ire in the competitive scene for its huge damage and reliability, especially when paired with Gibraltar's gun shield. While this update has brought it out of its short stint in S tier, this is still an A tier weapon in the right hands and in the right ranges. It's very much worth holding on to for the entire game, though if you're playing ranked and getting to the fifth circle or beyond, it would be pretty wise to swap it out for one of the plentiful R99s or maybe even an R301 at that point. This gun does great on Gibraltar specifically. The alternator's balance has not budged since its lost disruptor rounds a few seasons ago. It's still an acceptable gun in the early game, but you don't want to use it beyond that. Into mid game and beyond, you really should be targeting an R99 over this weapon to ensure the highest probability of winning games. The main draw of this weapon is that it's an attachment holder for an R99 or 301, and is better than some of the dregs you pick up like the Mozambique or the P2020. Beyond that though, this is a very forgettable bottom of C tier weapon, potentially even D tier, but we'll give it the benefit of the doubt and say that it's in C. Next up, the R99 is a gun that requires no introduction. Sporting one of the best TTKs in the game, easy to control recoil, excellent hip fire, and common attachments since everyone else is running this gun, it's incredibly hard to pass this one up. For more information on this gun, and our next one, the Prowler, Take a look at our recent video comparing these two weapons in depth, linked in the description below. This gun is very firmly in A tier, and much like the R99, the Prowler as well, needs little introduction. With a similar or better DPS and TTK profile to the R99, and with full attachments being an overall better R99, is there really much to say here? A select fire plus a level 1 heavy mag already puts you on fully kitted R99 level, and everything on top of that is just gravy. The Prowler is pretty much the tops of what an A tier weapon can be, but it's always balanced out by the fact that the irons are just okay at best, and that you only get 4 bursts per mag in a stock Prowler, but kitted out, this is one of the best weapons you can possibly hope for. Once again, check out the video linked in the description box below for a deep dive into the DPS, the TTK, and all of the reasons why the 99 and Prowler are basically your go-to best guns in the game for most situations. Moving into LMGs, let's talk about the Devotion first. The Devotion has been removed from the world as a standard weapon drop and is now a care package weapon. As a care package weapon, it's equipped standard with a 2x bruiser sight, a new high of 54 rounds per magazine, and a turbocharger pre-installed. Basically every downside of this weapon used to be based around this world drop nature. Ammo was not plentiful enough, turbochargers hard to find, and it was often just tough to justify despite being one of the strongest guns technically in the game. But now, with it being a care package weapon, all of those negatives are alleviated, so we're left with only the positives of this monstrous gun. Damage per second and TTK on the Devotion are nuts, and your projectile speed is second to none. The Devotion, of all things, has the fastest projectiles in the game. I find it incredibly easy to use, and despite the fact that it forces you to walk very slow when aimed down sights, enemies are generally not going to challenge you because your damage output is simply too high. They're not gonna just take your damage and try to outshred you with the 99 because they will most often lose. I generally feel that care package weapons defy ratings since they're special in nature and not part of the typical world drop pool. If you force me to rate it by definition, it's at the very top end of A tier, I guess. It's overpowered by nature, that's for sure, but it's not oppressive at all ranges, and there is some serious counterplay to it if you know that your opponent has one, so I think it's mostly fine. I haven't heard a single person complain about this weapon being overpowered, and that's one of the major symptoms of a weapon being in the S tier. So with that said, this gun sits pretty much at the pinnacle of A, 
and is pretty comfortable there, and I don't think anyone really has a problem with that. Spitfire, Spitfire, where do we go with the Spitfire? Quite frankly, this is one of the few guns that I just didn't even write a script for because there just frankly was no point. This is one of the most bottom of bottom tier guns in the entire game. It's okay early game, it's technically okay mid game, it has an effectively identical DPS and TTK to like the 301, but uh, I don't know about that for sure. I mean, the ammo type is common, I guess. The magazine is basically never ending. So even with just a white mag, you'll get like 40 in mag, which is a lot of bullets. You can shoot it for a long time. If you can barrel stuff someone with hip fire, the gun is pretty oppressive because you just keep shooting forever and they are guaranteed to die if they don't have the aim to kill you back. But with all that said, I, I mean, I just, I, I don't think the gun really has a lot to offer. You have a TTK and DPS that is not better than most assault rifles, that's for sure, despite the fact that you have to ADS walk even slower than those guns, meaning that you are an easier and easier target for opposing wingman, for opposing PK with choke, for opposing 99, for opposing prowler, for anything that's gonna shred you really fast from close to mid range, or beyond because you're just not even moving with this gun. It's tough to justify using the Spitfire. It really, really is. Your projectile speed is not great. The bullet drop is pretty great. And I don't mean that in a good way. I mean like there's a lot of drop. It's just, it's a tough gun to justify using. It's gonna burn through your heavy ammo fast. I don't see a situation where I would really decide that the Spitfire is the gun I want above all else. In literally every situation I could think of where I could potentially just, in a perfect world, say I have a Prowler fully kitted, I would rather have a Prowler full auto in 100% of those situations. I don't think the Spitfire makes any sense in this game right now. I don't see a purpose for its existence, and this is definitely an F-tier weapon. With that being said, I would definitely be on the lookout for some kind of buff or alteration to LMGs or maybe just a Spitfire in general in Season 5, 6, or beyond. Who knows when those will be, and who knows if we're going to see any changes at all, but I would be on the lookout for the Spitfire above everything else in the game to be a prime candidate for buffs. The L-Star is pretty massively changed since the last tier list where we didn't even talk about it. For starters, it's no longer a care package weapon, it's a world drop now, and it's replaced the Devotion. It accepts only two attachments, a stock and optics. Its TTK is pretty close to the R99 and Prowler, roughly a tenth of a second slower across all the different armor levels. The coolest part of this weapon, in my opinion, is that you no longer have to reload it. It'll pull ammo from your inventory infinitely as long as you've got enough ammo to feed it, and you don't overheat it. And even better news, the time it takes you to clear the overheat when you do inevitably do that is significantly reduced from the care package version, to the point where it's about the duration of a standard reload, so not even a big deal. The gun has overall become a lot easier to use while requiring nearly no attachments to run effectively. In addition, you can make cool plays like mag dumping the L-Star, stopping right before it overheats, swapping to a secondary gun for a few shots, then going right back to your now completely cooled off L-Star. This is one of the best ways to flex the L-Star, by being able to shoot guns continuously for a very long period of time. The final note I'd like to make is that the gun is in a lot of ways intended for hip fire at close range, and with practice can perform very, very well. While it's got a lot going for it, there's always going to be that odd game where energy ammo is tough to come across and it's tough to keep this gun fed. In addition, you'll have plenty of games where some of the top tier weapons like R99, Peacekeeper, Wingman, and Prowler are all easily available to you, which would take priority over this gun in most situations. For these reasons, I don't think it fits into A tier, so we'll place it into B tier for now. If your opinion on this one differs, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. It's time for snipers, and first up we've got the longbow. Since the loss of Skullpiercer, and with the very long ranges of fights in World's Edge, the longbow's usage rate seems to have plummeted from my perspective. While headshots still deal in excess of 100 damage to most targets, 
This weapon overall just doesn't seem that compelling to hold on to really late into a match. While the damage numbers on it are certainly annoying, and a good drain on enemy shield resources, I can't say that I often play matches where that ends up being a big deal at all. The game seems to mostly be in a meta of chunking people down quickly, or at least keeping heavy pressure in close to mid-range fights. Despite the massive size of World's Edge, SMGs and the Wingman still reign supreme in most situations. On top of all this, because sniper rifles have become their own class of weapon, they're now less useful to pick up than ever before, because they can't even serve as attachment holders for proper endgame guns. Having your longbow turn into a wingman or flatline in the late game was one of the best reasons to keep a longbow, but now that the ammo type and magazine no longer cross over, the damage dealt to sniper rifles in general seems impossible to overcome. The longbow in my view is currently a C tier weapon in relation to the rest of the metagame, and I think that sniper ammo and sniper magazines may be the culprit. I'd be very interested to see this weapon go back to utilizing heavy ammo and heavy magazines, perhaps using more than one quote-unquote bullet per shot, like the Anvil R301 or Anvil Flatline. Then maybe we could see sniper ammo being switched over to something like special ammo that's more broad in use and better suitable for balance purposes on some guns without needlessly killing others. Moving on to the triple take. This weapon was hurt just like all snipers across the board were hurt by the sniper ammo and magazine change. The triple take has the potential to burn through ammo really quickly, meaning that multiple stacks and sniper mags are kind of important. To run this gun, you need to loot a lot of buildings instead of other players, since very few are going to be carrying sniper stuff consistently. While this is a gun you could take into endgame and do fine with, Depending on the circle situation, it's certainly not ideal. Keeping it fed with ammo, getting your peacekeeper wielding teammates to give up their precision chokes to you, and finding a purple stock for it just doesn't feel consistent enough on a game to game basis. The triple take is a gun that you use and enjoy while you have it, but is something you should absolutely drop for something better once you get to an endgame situation and have free reign over an opponent's death box with two fully kitted guns inside. This weapon is the definition of C tier. Moving on to the charge rifle, we have a hit scan sniper rifle with a very high damage potential. What is there to even say here? In a game full of projectile weapons, you get a hit scan weapon that can do 90 plus per burst? Like, that's pretty good. Point and click on people, They'll explode before you, no questions asked. You've only got four shots per magazine and a reload on the order of like five seconds. So that kind of stinks, but every trigger pull is going to be big, big, consistent damage if you have the aim to support it. Even if you don't have the best of aim, if you catch a person standing still, you're going to drill them for so much headshot damage that you may or may not hit on your other snipers because you have to account for bullet drop, which you may not do perfectly. So the charge rifle just eliminates all of that. It's really good. In my opinion, the charge rifle is, in most situations, the best sniper rifle to pick up if you have to run a sniper, especially on World's Edge. And it doesn't even need sniper mags to function optimally, since it can't even take them anyways. It's really weird to me that the high damage, hit scan sniper rifle is the one that requires the fewest attachments of any to do its job, while the king of snipers of old in the longbow has received nerf after nerf after nerf to the point of obscurity now. This gun in my opinion is B tier, since once you get to endgame with it, you're likely to drop it for something better at close to mid range, but while you do have it, the potential output of this gun is so extreme that it outclasses everything else in the C tier, so it kind of transcends boundaries a bit to break its way into B tier. Your one kind of weakness with this weapon is going to be that when you're in these close range fights, your charge up beam itself, that like initial beam, is not accurate. It swings wildly around your screen. However, the final blast portion does go to the center of your screen, just like a railgun in an arena shooter, for, what, 45, 50 damage, depending on what you're hitting, whether they have fortified or low profile or whatever, so 
not terrible damage pretty consistent you don't need to aim down sights you can ad stray full speed you're going to hit that 45 damage burst plus a couple of ticks of the wind up beam so you know calling that about 50 damage on average is pretty fair i think and that's really not bad at all a hit scan beam for roughly 50 damage per body shot that you don't have to lead that is going to go to the center of your screen every time like that's that's all really nice so while this charge rifle is not intended or good in close range fights by any means. It is certainly the most consistent of all the sniper rifles, that is for sure. While the Sentinel is a brand new gun, I unfortunately don't have too too much to say about it, but we'll try to spread this out as much as I can. You deal 70 damage in a body shot, 140 on a headshot modified up or down by the opponent's damage resistance, and then modified down by the opponent's helmet type. As long as your opponent's got white armor, even with no helmet, you will never ever down them in one shot to the head when using this weapon. Even against Wraith, they'll only take 147 damage on a headshot with this gun, and they have 150 health with a level 1 body shield. You deal enough damage to force opponents to use 3 cells to repair damage on a body shot, but then again, so does a longbow, which has a significantly faster rate of fire, and seemingly the same projectile speed. This weapon, yet again, uses sniper ammo and sniper mags, which you have to loot a lot of buildings to find consistently, since players don't generally carry them. This takes away time spent from actually playing the game and, you know, shooting. It also can't take a barrel attachment, which some of you may be kind of raising your eyebrows at, like, why would that matter? This is a bolt-action sniper, it doesn't make a difference, but... That is a free inventory slot for you. You can carry that barrel to then swap onto another gun later when you throw your Sentinel away or give to a teammate. That means you have more room for meds. Say if you drop on a building and you find a gold barrel inside and a Sentinel and your teammate has an R99 and they spawn on the complete opposite side of your drop zone and they want that barrel, but you found a bunch of meds and like, you know, you would just have too many things to carry. Being able to stick that gold barrel on your Sentinel would be really good and would be a very, very minor, super minor, almost never useful buff, but is one of those things where it's just like, come on, like, just give the gun something. Frankly, there is no reason to bring this gun into endgame and high-level lobbies over any other sniper rifle, but it does have a significant fun factor and nice satisfying feel when using it, in my opinion, which makes it fine for casual. Despite it not being great, I personally target it in casual matches all the time, just because I think the gun is fun and feels good, despite the fact that it's objectively not good at all. To speak to the charge-up mechanic briefly, I mean, yeah, it's a thing you can do for a little extra damage on some body shots and leg shots, but with battery stack sizes being decreased from 3 to 2, having a big enough backstock of batteries to feel comfortable dumping one or two into your gun for, like, maybe 30 damage, maybe 55 if you're lucky against red armor, I suppose that the value of this mode increases, you know, against the red armor, but I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't think it's... I don't think there's a world where you bring a Sentinel into endgame to target a specific player who may or may not have that specific red armor type. The Sentinel teeters between D and F tiers for me, simply because I have no idea if Respawn intended this gun to be as weak as it is or not. If it's not meant to be like this, and they want it to be a stronger weapon for high-level players in high-level lobbies, they're gonna need to give it some special attention to get it up to even C tier. My guess and check attempt would be to embrace that this is a light sniper rifle, quote-unquote. So allow it to ADS faster. Allow it to have a faster strafe speed while ADS. Give it a faster reload time. Speed up the swap speed of this weapon. Let it have a barrel attachment or something else like that so when you swap away from it, you at least have that attachment transferring going on. Just give it, I don't know, out of this world handling in general and see if that doesn't do something good for this gun on the whole. I bet it might. Finally, for sniper rifles, we have the Kraber. And again, just like all three of our care package weapons, there's just not a whole lot to say here. These are weapons that are inherently overpowered and designed to be some of the strongest guns in the game from a pure power perspective, but they're balanced by being a care package drop. So 
it's intended to be this way. It's not going to be S tier overpowered because it's, it's designed to just be really strong. I don't think anyone is complaining that the Kraber is too good. In fact, some people might complain that it's not good enough because if you shoot at a Gibraltar with purple armor and purple helmet, you can't kill them in one shot. It's just not enough damage. So the gun is overall really good. 150 damage-ish body shots, depending on the opponent type you're shooting, is incredibly good. Take this gun, pair it with a 99, wingman, peacekeeper, prowler, or equivalent, and you're gonna do great. Just hit your shots. Excellent gun, great for all stages of the game. If you find one, you or your teammates should definitely run it 99% of the time, if not 100. Moving on to shotguns, this is pretty much going to be a repeat of what we said in the last tier list, because this gun has received pretty much no balance changes of note. A few very minor things, but not enough for the gun to move significantly. This is a weapon that is fine at all stages of the game. It only needs one attachment, and that can be either a bolt or a double tap, but having both is great. Double tap isn't too hard to find necessarily, because a lot of people are going to run G7, but a lot of people just don't use double tap and don't pick it up even if they have a G7 because they prefer the single fire mode, myself included. And same thing for EVA 8 users, is a lot of them are just not even going to take the double tap because they prefer the single fire mode and just don't even care to pick up the double tap. So your mileage will vary on that front. At least the EVA 8 has a common ammo type since everyone at high levels is always going to be rocking at least one peacekeeper per team. So, shotgun ammo, pretty easy to come across, more often than not. This gun has a longer effective range than you might affect from a shotgun, thanks to its tight, eight-shaped spread pattern. And at medium range, it's, because of this, surprisingly decent. But at a high level, again, no reason to use this over 99, wingman, peacekeeper, or prowler. Max damage per shot on this gun at close range is going to be about 57% of what the peacekeeper can do, so when you hit a perfect body shot on somebody, it feels largely ineffectual, but your rate of fire is really good, so if you hit multiples of those and you get a bunch of headshot pellets in there as well, the EVA 8 can be quite the monstrous weapon. Overall, it's just really consistent, really easy to use, close range damage, pair it with something like a wingman or R99 or prowler, and it's going to be a great finishing weapon for you to use, absolutely. I think this kind of teeters the B and C tiers from where it gets placed. It's really strong, not as good as Peacekeeper, but potentially very, very good. We'll give it B tier, we'll give it the benefit of the doubt and put it there. The Peacekeeper is in pretty much the same boat as the EVA in the sense that it hasn't received too much in the way of major balance changes recently, so it pretty much sits in the same A tier that it's always sat in. It's great in all stages of the game. It needs no attachments, really, after its most recent balance changes, but frankly, anything on it does help. One attachment on it in either a purple bolt or a precision choke makes the gun excellent. It's got a common ammo type. It needs very little of it on top of that. It's, it's just really good. Like, it's, it's an all-in-one package. It can do the close-range stuff. It can do the mid-range, it's a slug shotgun if you get your precision choke in there. Even though the spread has been increased ever so slightly, it still feels really easy to get 60 to 80 plus damage bursts on people from ranges that are really dumb for shotguns. At the super long range, you can just spam precision choke shots at people for like 10 to 20 damage and just be annoying, waste your extra shotgun ammo, you know, whatever. You can do all of it. This kind of just rides that line of what can be a weapon that is easy to balance. Like, if you nerf the damage even just a little bit on the Peacekeeper and you make it go from two bursts to three bursts to kill against something like a Gibraltar in close range, all of a sudden the gun becomes really difficult to justify running and its tier position kind of plummets. But in its current stance, it's really, really, really strong and is always going to be one of the top tiers of the game. It's just one of those difficulties of balancing high damage, low fire rate weapons like this, and also the Sentinel, where just a small little bit of tweak in your damage per second, your time to kill or whatever, will drop it from either its, its high, high tier position down to like mid or below, and then a small buff can bring it from super low tier to really strong. So 
this is one of those teeter-totter kinds of weapons where it's just really hard to balance right and i think it's mostly fine where it's currently at i think the big thing with this weapon feeling maybe inconsistent or weird for a lot of people might be just their internet connection their ping lag in general and it might be a little more easy to feel on this weapon than others and now for our last care package weapon again this is just like the kraber is there really much to say it's stupid strong and frees up a lot of your inventory space for grenades or for meds i would be impressed if you could actually use up all 24 shots in this thing and not win the game Stick this thing in your wraith and call it a day. A tier. Rounding out the shotguns, we have the Mozambique. This gun is still a dumpster fire even a year after Apex's launch. The biggest nerf to this weapon was the removal of the Mozambique chucking animation that they had added back in Season 0. Sure, Hammerpoint makes this gun better, but it certainly doesn't make the gun any good at all. Consistently finding Mozambique with Hammer Point is good for a slack off for fun style game, I guess, where you're trying to do some sort of self-imposed challenge or just make your life miserable. But if you're trying to win a Pred Lobby, don't bother with this thing unless you're trying to make your Twitch audience laugh your name is Asu or something like that. This is a D tier weapon for sure. And finally, we are into our pistols. The P2020 is in the same boat as the Mozambique. However, it's quite a lot more consistent of a weapon with hammer point than its distant cousin. The rate of fire is pretty good, and the damage versus an armor cracked opponent is nuts. If you're really confident in your aim, and you have a good team on voice chat with you that can call cracks for you to go and focus, go for this gun. If you've already got a Wingman, PK, 99er Prowler kitted out, but your second gun kinda blows, a P2020 with Hammer Point is definitely one of the best stopgap weapons you can pick up until you find a secondary top tier weapon for your loadout. If you want to challenge yourself in public lobbies, you can get a Sentinel to go along with this thing, charge a Sentinel up, hit a body shot to rip their armor, then instantly fast swap to a P2020 and shred their health. This gun is a meme for sure, but it's a good one. So I'll put it in C tier with hammer point and D tier without. Next up, the RE45. This is a pocket R99. If I had to make up a number off the top of my head and not bring math into this at all, it's like 60 to 70% of what the R99 is. For a super common low level weapon, that's really good. Being 70% of the R99 is a compliment given how monstrous that gun actually is. I'm not saying you should take this gun into endgame, but it's surprisingly good all the way up until your opponents have purple armor or better. Plus, it's a perfect attachment holder for your other light guns, so there's no reason not to hold onto this thing, at least for a little bit in your games. C tier by definition, for sure. And now we've saved the best for last, the Wingman. I still think the Wingman is the best overall gun in the game. I'm not sure if I'll ever move off of this hill, but it might be some rose tinted glasses going all the way back six years to Titanfall 1 that kind of makes me think this. The Wingman is as good as a sniper rifle at long range, as good as an assault rifle at mid range, as good as an SMG at close range, and only slightly lags behind the SMGs and shotguns in point blank fights. The magazine size is forgiving, the damage per shot is high, the headshot multiplier is strong, the weapon model is tiny and unobstructive, the need for attachments is effectively zero, and its ubiquity at all ranges is matched by none. Calling this gun the jack of all trades is an understatement. It's more like the queen, if not the king. Pairing this yet again with an R99, Prowler, Peacekeeper, or whatever else in the top tier category, makes for the best loadout you can possibly have for most situations with most of the cast, barring something like a G7 on a Gibraltar or something like that. And with that, everyone, that will just about do it for our weapon tier list. I guess I'll throw grenades in here really quickly, just off the cuff, because why not? Arc stars are still insane. Frags are still really good. Thermites are actually not that bad. 
I think you should probably keep them in your inventory in that order, especially with only being able to hold half as many grenades as you used to be able to. So that is definitely a thing. But I mean, I don't really want to go into too much depth because like they're nades, they're throwables. Just, just put them in the general area of your opponent. They go boom and do damage. And the fact that arc stars will slow people and make their aim unusable is definitely better than just about anything else. So definitely choose those over all other nades in most situations. With all that said, everyone, thank you for watching. We did this in like 20 fewer minutes in the last weapon tier list, so that's pretty cool. I will see you again, hopefully very soon, for more Apex content. Make sure you follow on Twitter, join the Discord, follow on Twitch. Say thanks for me spending so much time and effort making these tier list videos. I know I don't make them that often, and they are big undertakings when I do, so I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something new, and if nothing else, I hope the gameplay was at least entertaining for you. Thanks for being here. We'll see you again very soon. Take care.